So my name is Erin Wolf, and we are at NIH, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. My primary function is to do research in women's health. So I see patients in clinical trials here in the clinical center, and then I also do some basic research in the laboratory. So I grew up in a small town in Ohio, out in the country, and I was interested in biology and went to undergrad and studied biology. I took a class where it was a reproductive elective, and I was sitting in the clinic, and they were doing their first gestational carrier cycle, and it was for a woman that had been born without her own uterus. A different woman that was going to carry the pregnancy came in and spoke to us, and she talked to us and said that she just always had this dream to help someone else after she read a book in high school. We were talking with the fertility team, and we were like, well, whose name is going to go on the birth certificate? And they hadn't really even figured that out. The laws weren't in place. The medicine was barely in place. And these doctors were sort of on the cutting edge of this technology. So then I decided to do OBGYN, knowing that I wanted to go into infertility eventually. So I, my primary focus is uh, trying to find new ways to help women with infertility who can't make new eggs on their own, so their eggs have run out. So we're working with ovarian stem cells, trying to figure out ways to, to make new eggs. And so we're trying to see if those eggs fertilize normally. Before, in the, even 10 years ago, it was really difficult to freeze eggs. So if people that had cancer wanted to try and freeze some embryos before they underwent chemotherapy or radiation, their only option was to freeze an embryo. So after the egg had been fertilized, but for young girls that needed cancer therapy or other types of therapies that didn't have a partner, it was a very difficult decision. So what we're actually starting for the first time and one of the patients that I saw this morning is that they can now do bone marrow transplants for sickle cell disease. So we collaborate closely with the sickle cell team and we have a 19-year-old patient who's going to have her eggs frozen and it'll be the first egg freezing at NIH. So she's going to undergo a bone marrow transplant at the end of next month, and then this will hopefully enable her to be able to have her own children, which she wouldn't otherwise be able to have. Since I do both clinical work and basic science, it's a little bit of a juggling act. Some days I'll have a patient that's scheduled, so I'll go up and talk to them for an hour and do an exam and do an ultrasound and see if their ovaries look normal and their uterus looks normal. Yeah, I'm still hungry all the time. Like if I Pregnancy is like an accelerated starvation mode, yeah. and your blood sugar spikes earlier. Yeah. Did you have a lot of nausea at yes. the beginning? Yeah. And then I'll run down and talk to the team here about the ongoing stem cell projects that we have and look at data and think about what might be a good next thing to do or try and figure out why we're getting the data that we're getting. So I have the two tubes Perfect. for it. The other part, we're going to do the digest, but that part you know. Yeah, it's already in there. And okay, it, great. You let that sit for like 15 minutes, yep. right, is what you said. Yep. So that's already going. So we saw a patient this morning who was a healthy volunteer who wanted to donate endometrial tissue to look if there's immune cells that somehow are rejecting the embryo when it implants. So maybe if there are some people with infertility, that it's because the embryo isn't able to implant in the uterus. This one's growing well. So we're studying these samples to see if the numbers or the percentages of those immune cells are altered, too high or too low. What's not known is if it's normal to have any organisms that live in the uterus, in the lining of the uterus, called the endometrium. So we're also checking these endometrial samples for the microbiome. IVF has happened in our lifetime and it's really changed the way people have families. And so I'm hopeful that there's a way that we can find to have stem cells affect people's ability to have families within my lifetime. Potentially, there might be ways that we would freeze stem cells instead of needing to freeze an egg and that all women could bank stem cells at a young age in case they had any problems with infertility down the road or their ovaries failed unexpectedly. So at NIH, one of the benefits of being here is there's so many smart people. And so you have some very, very stimulating conversations. You get to really think about the, the frontiers of where medicine is and where science is. Follow your heart, and if something excites you, that's where you need to go, even if it doesn't, even if there's not a clear path. So if you're not sure why something is exciting to you, or someone says, well, there's no jobs in that area, it's more important to do something that you love and follow what, what's exciting to you. Thank <laughs> you.